Lecture 13. Last week we had the midterm. No, it's not corrected yet. Um, will be one of my things I do over spring break. For lab number six, if you are ahead of um, your schedule, I haven't seen any lab number five submissions yet, so I don't think anybody is there yet. But go and pick up a radio, one antenna, and two connector wires from MEB 1381. Um, so everybody needs one if you are a team of two because you need the radios to communicate with each other in lab number six. So everybody should pick one up. Um, extension for lab number five. Um, I think you should be able to finish it up over spring break so that you can actually hand it in the week after spring break when you start with lab number six, I think. Is that right? I think that's when lab number six starts. So. Yes, no, you don't have to hand it in during spring break, but after spring break um, is just fine. And then for spring break, there will be no lab support and no office hours. If you have questions, use Canvas. I'm pretty sure my students will be sitting on there. Um, I will occasionally check it too to answer um, questions if you have anything um, for help. Then um, project proposals are due now. Um, who has not submitted them yet? One. How many groups is this? So only one person per group, hand up. One, two. You submit it or not? OK. So two groups. OK, good. So it looks like we have about 17 groups then. Um, for the sign up and the discussion and the reviews for um, Wednesday, so for tomorrow and Thursday, in only one person per group has to sign up. All right. So and then basically everybody from the group shows up and we discuss and talk about your project. I hope, or be, I'm, I hope that I will be able to look at them this afternoon to see what your proposals are about, and then I can talk to you of what you have to change or give you a different option if you use robotic platforms and stuff like that. So maybe we can change it around a little bit. Then we can use something that we have already um, in our lab, um, but I can't make any guarantees yet. All right. During the projects, um, I don't just want to let you go off um, free and then you just hand in the final report at the end. Um, I have seen that it's really necessary to keep track with your projects. Don't just think I will do this in the last week right before it's due. This project will take a lot of time. I think you have seen now during the labs, oftentimes some very little things can just suck up time and problems that you can't solve that are really trivial or you think they're trivial, but then they just need time to actually solve and go through to figure out where the bug is. So start early. And in order to do this, we will have regular project reviews. So during the TA times or during the, the regular um, lab hours, what we'll do is we will make small little reviews, five to 10 minutes. We will schedule them. And so you schedule one of these sessions per week that you either talk to the TA, talk to me, or send an email with what your progress has been and what you think to be expecting to be, have done by next week's meeting. Um, this will be 5% of your regular grade, so please do these reviews. They are very important. All right. What we talked today about is more of what we will do in lab number six, or at least a little bit of what's happening in lab number six. And more specifically, what we'll talk about is wireless communication. We use wireless communication in every day. I mean, his phone just got a wireless message, apparently. Um, so we use it all the time. It's just around us. But then how does it really work and what's the concept behind wireless right how can we cut the cord anybody what's the easiest way of cutting a cord scissors, scissors. scissors yes but then you will be dead and nothing will happen anymore radio. radio frequencies is it easy can you see them can you hear them how do they work light 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 yeah so what could you do with light? How could you cut a cord with light? So I have a light sensor. A light sensor? And an LED. And an LED that blinks? Mm -hmm. That could work. How about sound? Are we talking with wires? No, right? Humans communicate wirelessly. There's no wires between me and you. And that's actually exactly the com concept behind wireless communication. So how does it work, if you think about it? How do I communicate information to you? So it compresses waves, that's how the, it travels over, yes? Magic. Magic, not really. 
<laughs> language. Good one, yeah. Right? We have a certain notation of the signals that I produce that gets to your ear and gets interpreted for a certain way. Right? In our case, there are analog signals. There are compressions of the wave that change with frequencies, and the different frequencies mean something. So how can we translate this into digital communication? How could we do this digitally? Certain protocol, yes. But okay, what, what is digital at the very base? What's digital signal? Ones and zeros. Ones and zeros, exactly. So you could imagine it's just tone is a one, right? And no tone could be a zero. So if I make beep, how many ones was that? So what, what do we need to know? Baud rate, yeah, data rate, right? So we had a protocol that we talked about in the serial communication that did not have a clock signal. UART, yes. So could we just take UART and send it over wireless? Say all the ones that we have are a tone and all the zeros that we don't have are silence? Technically, yeah, really? What? I'm not keen, sure. So what about the receive and the transmit. You never said it was good, but it could work. How about you are? What is it? Can we transmit and receive at the same time? Yes. We have a ramp. Trans transmit line, the receive line, right? Well, if you have two lines, okay. Yeah, we have two lines in you are. That's the definition of it. But in wireless, oftentimes you only have one channel. It's a half duplex channel. Do we know an I, uh, a serial protocol that has this half duplex? I square C? Yes. I square C is half duplex, but it has a clock. So in wireless communication, we have to do kind of like a, a mix between different things, right? So we have to do I square C, where it's a half duplex channel, so we have to have some sort of addressing if I talk to somebody. While we have to do something like in UART where we don't have a clock, so we have to agree on a certain protocol so we can actually decode on what's going over the channel. And that's kind of what happens in wireless communication. All right. So let's talk about the problems that we have in wireless communication. One of them is it's half duplex. We usually get assigned a certain frequency that we can talk to, and then the signals are like a pan pass signal, so they only occupy a certain bandwidth inside that frequency spectrum so that other people can use the channel too, right? So that's actually how you can make it multi-user friendly so that multiple people can say, use the same spectrum. So if I had an extremely high voice that somebody couldn't hear, then he can talk at a different frequencies. We can talk at the same time without interfering with each other. And if you go to the FCC website, you will see something like this. So the FCC is actually a commission that tells who can use which frequency spectrum and how much of that spectrum they can actually use. And if you look at this chart, you can see it's actually extremely busy. Right? If you look up here, we can see this up here. Oh, no, we can't read it up there. Broadcasting, AM. So this is AM radio down here. Then all these blue ones are other... Up here we have some TV channels, there's some FM radio broadcasting, and then a couple of these slots are actually what's called the ISM frequencies, which are the frequencies that are unlicensed, where everybody can use them, but there are certain rules that you have to um, adhere to in order to use these particular spectrums. So for example, the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum that everybody uses on their laptops in, in Wi-Fi, or the 5 gigahertz spectrum that uh, the newer Wi-Fi systems are using, these are unlicensed bands, so everybody can use them, as long as you are nice to other people, right? And we can talk about what nice is later on. So going back one step, wireless communication is information that gets transmitted using RF frequencies, and it's always a passband signal. So you're only using a certain spectrum up there in this frequency range. So for example, if you do AM or FM modulation, AM stands for amplitude modulation, FM for frequency modulation, what happens is that you take the information that you have 
and you modulate it on top of a carrier. So for example, in this case up here we have a signal that could be some voice, some audio, anything like that. And then you modulate it on a carrier, for example like in this one here, and you modulate it on top of it, so you have a bass carrier that's very fast, and then you change its amplitude. That way, on the other side, all you have to do is you look at the envelope of that signal, and you get the original signal back out. While at the same time, we use the spectrum that was at a higher frequency, due to the modulation on a certain carrier. That's amplitude modulation. Frequency modulation, you don't change the amplitude, but what you change is the frequency of your signal. So by going a little bit faster and a little bit lower, slower, what you then can do on the receiver side, you just take out what these deltas of the frequencies are, and you will get back your original signal. So that's what frequency modulation is. Yes? Is one better than the other on one hand is more benefits? How would you characterize There's all kinds of different things, yes. We won't go into details of what's better and what's not, and there's a lot of theory behind it. If you're really interested in it, there's a course that we teach here, wireless communication. Everything in there is about that. How do you go from one signal to the other? How do you decode it? What's better, what's not? What has more susceptibility to noise and stuff like that? So we, I just want to give a little overview of what wireless communication is so that you can start looking into wireless communications later on as a tool. So now going to digital signals, instead of having analog systems, what we have is an alphabet. So in this particular case, we have an alphabet of m is equal to 2 to the power of n alternative symbols. Each has a size n. Okay? So basically, we have n bit symbols. So we get 2 to the power of n different symbols. And we somehow have to transmit these different symbols from me to you. You decode these symbols, and then you know which particular letter in our alphabet I try to tell you. Right? So assume we have this alphabet. Now, if we transmit them at a frequency fs symbols per second, we can find the bit rate of n times fs. Make sense? So every symbol is n bits long, right? So we have 2 to the power of n different symbols. And if we have a certain data rate, a frequency, if we send them at a certain frequency of fs, we get fs times n bits per second. That's the data rate that you usually talk about. Now, how can we translate these different symbols into something that we can actually send over the wireless channel? Well, there are a lot of different fundamental frequencies. One of them is phase shift keying. We'll look at that in a second. Frequency shift keying, where you shift the frequency on different frequencies. So you jump from different frequencies, and you know which frequency is which particular symbol. Amplitude shift keying, so we can have different levels of digital amplitudes, and that way I can give you a different um, symbol, or we can do a mix and match between several of them, which would then be quadrature amplitude modulation, which is actually something which is part of phase shift keying and amplitude modulation. So we're going to look at phase shift keying and QAM um, over the next couple of slides. Any questions so far? Okay. Phase shift keying. Well, phase shift keying is one of the easier modulation schemes. What you do is you have a stream of ones and zeros, right? 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. You then have a carrier wave at a certain frequency. And a 1 would be one phase on the signal, while a 0 is just a phase shift. So at the transition of, to the 0, what you do is you phase shift your signal by 180 degrees for the length of a 0. And then you shift it back for the 1. You shift it back for the 0 back here. You shift it back for the 1, etc., etc. So now, this particular signal can be decoded on the receiver side, and every time when you have a phase shift, you know that you're now in the other symbol. Right? So in this particular case, for binary phase shift keying, we have m equal to. So how many bits do we have? How many bits per symbol? Four? If m equal to, one bit. Right? M is the size of the alphabet. So M is the number of symbols that we have. Now we can go to quadrature phase shift keying. So instead of going and shifting by 180 degrees, like in this case, we just shift by 90 degrees into a certain direction. So we now get four different symbols. So how many bits do we have now? Two bits, exactly. 
Then we can do 8 PSK, so you can divide this further down and further down, and you increase the size of your alphabet. What could be the problem with this? Sorry? Noise, the difference between two becomes smaller, right? So the decoding becomes more problematic. So if you have a little bit of noise in there, like the more symbols you have, the more difficult it could become to actually figure out which exact symbol that you transmit. And there are a lot of different techniques that you can then apply in order to mitigate these kind of issues. Differential phase shift keying is um, where you encode your symbols in the difference between the phase. So if you go one way or the other way, it can mean something else. And then you can have offset quarter of phase shift keying, which is something I will talk about right now. So binary phase shift keying, if you have seen IQ diagrams, you can basically think as a zero is on the left-hand side of the I, uh, of the Q, I channel, and one is on the right-hand side, right? That's, if, if you look at the unit circle, that's like 180 degrees shift. Now, offset quadrature phase shift key is something where you have quadrature phase, so we have four phases, quadrature phase shift keying, you would have a one here, one here, one here, one here. Offset quadrature phase shift keying, you have them at the one, one position is here, zero, one here, zero, zero here, and one zero here. Now the trick is that in quadrature phase shift keying, you would encode it like this, where you have a one one, one a signal on the I and on the Q channel, would give you the one one. You have a zero zero, a zero one, a one zero, like this. In offset, in offset quadrature phase shift keying, you shift one of these channels by half a symbol length. So what would happen is that now the one is here, the other channel is one is here, while the zero is up here, and this zero is down here. What does this make, or what does this do? It guarantees us one specific thing. Sorry? Is it, noise reduction? Is that it does do something to the signal, yes. It does. Yes? Has better spectral efficiency, but why? Yes. Smaller changes. Yes. It only changes one bit at a time. So it guarantees that we never transition through the zero point. Right? In the other case, when you go from a 1, 1 to a 0, 0, the signal will go somehow from here to here through the zero point, which is really bad. You, you kind of want to avoid that because that means the signal is going away and comes right back up. Right? This is the amplitude that changes. You want to avoid that. So in this case of OQPSK, you will always just shift either the first bit or the second bit. So you either will go over here or you will go down here. You will never go across the zero point. So you get better spectral efficiency because your signal is always there. It's fairly constant. It jumps around the circle like this. That's why oftentimes instead of just doing a QPSK, you actually do an offset QPSK, shifting one of the two channels by um, half a symbol. Yes? So, if our only two signals actually exist, but on the bottom, is that what your actual signal looks like? So you validate the person with you. Take the wireless communication class. <laughs> it's basically how to go from complex signals and IQ channels, how you get them into a one signal and then back out into an IQ channel. It's like you multiply and by sines and cosines, and the math turns out if you add some filtering into it. Make sense? So it's, there's signals and systems is probably one of the classes, yes, and then go on with wireless communications to actually get there. Who has taken a wireless communication class? Few, okay. So this is kind of the magic that happens. All right. So one thing that I told you before is that quadrature amplitude modulation, which is what actually Wi-Fi uses to get very high data rates. So in this case, you do a phase shift and you modulate the amplitude at the same time. And then your constellation starts to become something like this, right? Instead of having everything on the unit circle, you now also jump around with the amplitude itself. Dangerous thing here is, of course, the closer these dots get together, the more you're susceptible to noise. 
So now you have to have detection that if the signal that you receive sits, for example, in here, you somehow have to find out to which dot you're closest. And then you assume that was probably the signal that somebody wanted to send me. Yes? I'm sorry, what? Uh-huh. You're, you're skipping ahead a little bit. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. So what, it, what was it? This question was, if you assume you have a certain amplitude, right? If you go further away from each other, which we will talk about in a second, your signal will drop. Your signal strength will get smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Like, we can see this here. When, I, when, when he's talking back there, I hear him worse than somebody that's closer to him. So how do you make sure that our understanding of this circle here, this amplitude, is the same? You do amplify it, but even in your amplification, you're not entirely sure, right? If you just receive one signal, you don't know if this person was very far away and it was a really strong signal, or if he's really close and it was actually a very faint signal, right? You still have the exact same problem, right? If we say the maximum distance is 50 meters in here, right? You still have the problem, like, you, how do you agree on the right levels? Yes? Yeah. So you have some preconditioning that you have to do. So if I send you a packet or a message, I tell you, well, the first initial few bytes will always be exactly this symbol, right? And then you can calibrate your circuitry to figuring out what the rest of the symbols will be. Yes. Each and every single packet. And there's in some more complex systems, there is even a lot more happening in this first few bits. You do synchronization of your clocks in this particular bit, so you get better, result, uh, better accuracies in figuring out when the different transitions are. There's all kinds of stuff that can happen. You can do channel estimation to try and remove some of that. Um, general inaccuracies that are get into there and stuff like that. So. And that's why what's basically called an overhead. Overhead on wireless communication is fairly big. Yes? How large is the packet? Sorry? How, how large is the packet? Depends again on the communication protocols. It can range from a few bits or bytes. Uh, for example, in this system here, IEEE 802.15.4, and the maximum data size is 128 bytes. While in Wi-Fi, it's, I think, about a kilobyte of data that it can send per packet, at least. And then, of course, if you want to reduce your overhead, you want to make as long packets as possible, because then you have to pay the overhead only for each and every one of these large chunks of data. Any questions so far? So, going yes. Back to the last slide, so we have four different right? In this one here, you have one, two, three, four amplitude levels, yes. So why four, why not say it looks So this way you make four dots on four different levels, gives you the 16. There is also a 256 QAM, which some of the higher speed data rates are, because the more dots and symbols you have, right, the more bits per symbol you can actually transmit if you keep at the same symbol rate. If I had only eight symbols and I used the same data rate as for the 16, I just halved my data rate. While if I go to 256 symbol and keep it at the same symbol rate, I quadrupled eight times my data rate. But at the same time, I now have a lot more noise susceptibility. But the problem is you might need higher signal to noise ratios for higher QAM rates because you need stronger signals, you need more clearer, purer signals in order to actually decode all the different possibilities of symbols that you get. So that's where it becomes important. Where sometimes wireless systems degrade in their QAM level, they go from 256 to 32 to 16 to 8 QAM, depending on how much noise there is in the signal, how far you are away of a person. So they can actually reduce their data rate have better um, signal to no, no, not better signal to noise ratio, but better transmit um, capabilities, even though you're now slower. 
All right. So let's do an example of IEEE 802.15.4. IEEE 802.15.4 at the very base uses offset quadrature phase shift keying. So it has four um, symbols, so two bits per symbol. And then it adds a lot of other decoding and encoding into, this, into the play. And many wireless systems have something like this similar happen. So what do we have? Well, first, we have our bit stream. We then encode these bits into symbols. We then encode these symbols into what they call chips. And then from the chips, they go to, into the modulator to actually make the OQPSK signal. So at the lowest rate, we have 200, they declare that we have 250 kilobits <coughs> per second. So that's the bits that we use to actually send over. They then get encoded into symbols. And in this case, what they call the symbols is actually the translation of the data down here. They say that a symbol of zero corresponds to this particular chip sequence. A symbol of one corresponds to this particular chip sequence, etc., 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 down to 16. So what they have is they have 16 symbols. So every half <coughs> byte is one symbol. That's why we have uh, we, we quartered it from 250 to 62. Is it right? Yes. So every four bits correspond to one symbol. And then every symbol corresponds to this long chip sequence. There are 32 bits in here. There are four bits over here. What could be the reason for this, too? Why would you say you take four bits that's nice and short and you make it 32 bits? Yes? Spread spectrum. Spread spectrum, okay. What does it mean, though? What's the reason for doing this? Spreads the information or spreads the energy out across all frequencies or uh, frequency areas, isn't it? Nope. Okay. It's partially, yes. But what, what's really, if, if you just think about it without knowing what spread, spread spectrum means or anything, what, what do you do here? Yes? Robust against errors. Why? It is more redundant, absolutely. So how could we make these more redundant? Do you think these, these zeros and ones are just chosen arbitrarily in a random number generator? Huh? No? Yeah. So these are actually chosen very specifically to be what's called as orthogonal to each other as possible. If you have heard of the Hamming distance, if you take the Hamming distance between all of them, they try to reduce the Hamming distance. So you will not find, there's only a very few bits that actually correspond to each other across these 32 bit streams. So what does this help you? Well, remember that you can get some of the symbols when you receive them wrong, like so that you could think something is a zero, but actually it was a one. So the key here is that even if one of these bits or two of these bits are actually wrong, you can still find out that, hey, he actually transmitted symbol number eight. Right? Because it's closest to this one here compared to all the other ones. So that's why, yes, you add redundancy into the system, but instead of just transmitting eight, eight times, you're a little bit smarter in what you actually transmit and translate over. Make sense? Okay. So we go from 250 kilobits per second to the 16 symbols. So every half byte or every four bit becomes now a symbol. And every four of these bits now get expanded into 32 bits, right? So the symbol to chip rate is now all of a sudden two mega chips per second. Yes? Is it mega chips or mega bits? Mega chips. <coughs> it's, so well, it's bits if you look at these numbers here as bits. Oh. So is each chip a 32 bit sequence? Or is it each bit in the 32-bit sequence? Okay, yes. It's each chip is one of these long numbers. Oh. You're right. So it's not two mega chips per second, it's two mega bits per second, where each bit is one bit inside of a chip sequence. Yes? So you're like, whatever, I don't understand it anymore. You're it's it's over. 
Okay, look, it's, it's really not that hard. What happens is you have a data rate of 250 kilobits per second, right? That's bits data that you want to transmit over to the other person. You now know that every four bit becomes one symbol, right? So the symbol rate is now four times smaller, right? Because every symbol is four bits, four bits, four bits, four bits. So if the, your initial bits come at 250 kilobits per second, the symbols now come four times slower, right? So that's the 62.5 kilobits per second. Now each symbol expands into 32 bits. So during one of the symbols, you now have to transmit 32 bits. So you have to go 32 times faster. So if you multiply 62.5 times 32, you get the 2 megabits per second on the chip sequence. Okay? That then gets translated into OQPSK. Basically gets split up into two symbols and transmitted over. And on the other side, the exact inverse happens. First comes a OQPSK demodulator that gets decoded into chips. So you try to figure out which one of the sequences actually got transmitted, translated into symbols, and from the symbols back into your data stream. So could somebody imagine a way of doubling your data rate very easily using almost the exact same architecture? So instead of going at 250 kilobits per second, I want to go at 500 kilobits per second. Sorry? Exactly. If we have our chip sequence to only 16 bits, what happens? We now get over here 100 and what is it? 125 kilobits per second, right? Going over to this one here, we will now get half a megabit per second. And that's actually what you can find in many of these 80254 radios these days, that they have the standard 80254 compliant mode where they use the 32-bit chip sequences, but then you can use them in half a megabit, megabit, and up to two megabit modes, where they just start reducing the chip sequence to the point where you get to the actual chip rate or to the actual bits per second of your radio, and that's where they max out. At the same time, of course, you now sacrifice redundancy in your data, so you have to have better signal-to-noise ratios if you use you know, 2 megabits instead of at 256 kilobits per second. Yes? Okay, I guess the question I should have asked earlier is what's the difference between a chip and a spread spectrum uh, I should know it. I don't know right now. Okay. It's, so what happens is, yes, you do spread your spectrum because you go to a higher data rate. So yes, you, you use a bigger part of the spectrum now. So you do spread it over a larger code. Right? You go from a rate of 250 kilobits per second to 2 megabits per second. So yes, you do spread it in frequency space. But I didn't want to go into that spectral stuff. All right. Any other questions? Okay, so now we have the theory a little bit done, right? You understand what's going on in there. So how does this now actually work inside a chip? And that's where the magic happens. You get a radio chip, right? We are embedded engineers. We don't want to design a radio. We just go out there and buy one. And if you then go to the data sheet, what you will find is something like this. And that's where the gore details are actually explained, right? You have power amplifiers over here. This is where the antennas get connected. Then you have some summations in here. You have multipliers. You have frequency synthesizers. So that's where all the magic happens in RF spectrum to get it up into a certain frequency and back down into a frequency where you can work at. And guess what? These things here, actually these days, are mostly digital. They have ADCs in them and DACs in them to actually get the stuff from an analog domain into a digital domain, and then the rest they do in modulators and demodulators that are done in the digital domain these days. Because it's a lot easier than actually worrying about it in the analog domain. Details about this um, we won't talk about, but um, if you're interested in it, I think we have a RF chip design class these days. Or if not, um, Jeffrey Walling, who is one of our faculties here, works on exactly these kind of things and devices. 
Okay, so can somebody answer me this question? Why should you care about wireless embedded systems? It's part of Lab 6, yes. <laughs> Though actually in Lab 6 you don't really use the wireless. I'm using the wireless chip as an excuse for a spy or serial peripheral. So, but why should you care about wireless embedded systems? If you care about embedded systems, why should you care about wireless embedded systems? Has anybody had the latest modern TVs, looked at them, what Samsung and LG is coming up with? Or Intel for that perspective? They don't want you to use cords anymore. Everything is going wireless, right? They now use, instead of HDMI cables, they now have a wireless HDMI standard. What about USB? Well, even USB has a wireless standard. There's wireless USB. This little thing here, wireless. Your cell phones, wireless. Everything is wireless these days. So that's why you really should start caring about wireless systems because you need to understand them. If you will touch an embedded system later on, there will be a component of it that has a wireless chip inside of it. So the nice part is that many of the difficult parts of wireless embedded systems are actually taken care of in modules. And there are a lot of different modules out there that you can use. We have the XBs, which are basically 802.54 radios on the bottom, and then have a nice software architecture around them to make them very easy to use. For example, the easiest way of using an XB is just through a UART. You have two of these devices, and they make a wireless UART for you. You send UART in on one side, you get UART out on the other side. Bam, you have a wireless embedded system. There is a lot of other ones. Um, there is the Atmel AT RF230. There is a, it's a whole series. There's a 230, 231, 232, 233 chips that are basically 8254 radios, but they're a lot more complicated to use because now you have to actually write a driver and talk through SPI to them to make them work and to do the things you want them to do. There is um, AND radios, which is a different standard. Of course, Wi-Fi now becomes more and more prevalent, not just in our laptops, but actually down into the embedded systems. TI is coming up with, uh, came out with a chip, the CC3000, which is not much more expensive than any of the other radios, but now gives you Wi-Fi in a chip that's like that size, that you can use in your embedded systems. You can connect your things to the internet. Cellular phones, of course, you can also get them not just in cell phones, but you can actually buy cellular phone chips that are about this size. So this Telic chip, I don't have a, well, I don't have a picture of it down here. This is a cell phone in a module. All you have to do is plop, plop an antenna on it, plug in a SIM card, and off you go. You get a cell phone on a chip. So there's many other standards out there. There's RFID, which is a different type of um, wireless. Dash 7, Bluetooth, C-Wave, Ruby, NFC, many, many different wireless standards are out there. And sometimes it's difficult to figure out which one you actually want to use. Yes? So, do any of these chips have like modular stack or how do you mm -hmm. take your application? For example, the XP, right, has a full network stack for you. All you have to do is give it a UART signal in on one side, you get UART out on the other side. So the rest is taken care of inside the chip. Others, not. So for example, these Atmo 86 RF230s, they are bare bone wireless transceiver chips. So you have to implement the whole networking stack itself. We're gonna talk about that in a second, actually. Yes? So with the Nordic NRF 2481, it's even though I mean, so it's an AMP protocol, right? Yes. Many of the things that de happen these days is that they all reside in a 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. So if you go back to this diagram over here, they all operate in 2.4 gigahertz. They all have more or less the same spectral sensing that has, has to happen. So the ADCs and DACs have to operate more or less at the same data rates. And the rest is done in digital domain. So what happens is that they just have different digital blocks that will take care of the different wireless protocols that are out there. So that you now get hybrid chips that can talk Bluetooth, 802.15.4, and many other protocols all just in one little chip. Because the front end over here doesn't have to change for the different systems. This is also what happens when you start talking about software-defined radios. If you have heard about software-defined radios, basically it's a radio that you only have this part here in hardware and the rest back here is taken care of in software or in FPGAs. 
And then you can go and change your modulation schemes and your decoding and everything, all in software by uploading a new image into your software-defined radio pr platform, because the front end is basically the same for each and every one of these radios. So one student up in Michigan that I worked with, we saw a picture of this software-defined radio platform before. He implemented a full 802.15.4 inside of the FPGA in Verilog. So it's possible. It maxed out the chip, but it's possible. <laughs> All right, so he pointed to it, right? You can now see radio chips as some that ship with a full networking stack where it becomes a lot easier for you to use. So for example, some of these um, new Wi-Fi chips, they have a full TCP IP stack on there where all you have to do is tell them to which port you want to connect to and they make an internet connection to an IP address for you. Take care of all the wireless ugliness that happens out there. In so others, you have to actually invest into implementing this particular wireless stack by yourself. And to just look at one of these stacks, what happens is that you have some sort of a source that sits in your program, right, in the TCP IP stack that will, for example, be an application or a server sitting on a certain port. You then have to have some sort of a multiplexing because usually you want more than one thing inside of your applications use the same wireless chip you then have what's called a MAC or medium access control protocol that will delegate on when can you access the wireless channel because there might be other people talking on the wireless channel. And before you go into the modulator, into a power amplifier, you then get the thing that's called the radio channel, which we'll look at in a second. While on the other side, you have RF filters, emulators. You again have a medium access control protocol, which will see if a message is for you or not. You will then demultiplex the whole thing and get back some sort of destination. So you will look at what message came in from the radio and then delegate it to a certain application on your embedded platform or a function that gets called with a certain um, code. Most of the times, this part here is implemented in software, while this part here is usually taken care of in hardware. This all looks nice, right? Wireless is easy so far. Now, the thing that comes in is this guy here, the radio channel. And the radio channels can be extremely tricky to deal with. Who can tell me some of the things that could happen in a radio channel? Or what could you imagine? Just think about us speaking. What kind of things happen? Multipath echo. Multipath echo, exactly. If you ever have been in a bad auditorium and listened to a speaker, it's almost impossible to hear them because you hear it bouncing off the wall from everywhere. You get echoes and it gets really difficult to actually understand what somebody says. What else? Noise, yes. If Enoch over there is loud and starts talking or his cell phone is going off, you will have problems understanding me, right? <laughs> Anything else? Doppler shifts, yes. If I start moving around, you will get Doppler shifts in a sequence. Yes? I'm not sure what this is called, but like when I'm in the, if I'm talking to someone on a cell phone, I go into the elevator in the, in the MEB, it, it cuts out, <coughs> or you go into the... Yeah. Here. Walls. Walls. <laughs> it's called walls. <laughs> <laughs> right? If you go outside, you won't hopefully hear me anymore, or at least it will be very degraded, right? There's a certain amount of power I have to put in my voice to, to reach you. He over here hears me probably very well, but the people in the last row probably sometimes have some problems because I'm not speaking up loud enough. So let's look at the first problem, and that's path loss. That's actually an excellent introduction into this slide. Thank you. Um, what happens is that you lose over the path. I have to put a certain power into the signal, and over the course of the distance that it travels, you will lose power. And how this power changes is what's called the free loss constant, or the path loss constant. So in general, it's about proportional to 1 divided by the distance to the power of n. And this n uh, up here is 1 divided by d to the power of n. This n changes depending on what kind of environment you're in. So out in free space, this is a perfect 2. Excellent. But that's only in outer space. In here, urban areas 2.7 to 3.5. So think about it, what that means. Instead of going a certain distance, if the n is now a 3.5, that distance will become a lot shorter 
for the same amount of power that you can receive, right? Going into shadowed urban cellular radio phones, so that's when you, for example, are walking around in New York City, this can reach up to five. Becomes really bad. In buildings, line of sight, this can actually become better. 1.6 to 1.8. How could that be? Sorry? Air noise. That it gets better? So think about it this way. In free space, when there's no obstruction, nothing, it's a two. Inside a room, it can go to 1.6 to 1.8. It's directionality and bounces off the wall. That they can be bad, but they also can help you. You can get what's called constructive interference, where two signals travel and then interfere with each other, but in a constructive way instead of destructive, like and actually help you. Yeah, exactly. So if the, the auditorium is built, then, for example, the cones around here are so that the waves that bounce back also come to you, it can help sometimes. And other problem is, as he said, if you go into an elevator inside a building, if you go around corners and stuff like that, it can get really, really worse. Right? If you don't have direct line of sight anymore, this can become up to a six. So inside buildings, wireless is actually really difficult to do, unless you really have line of sight. And then, if you are in factories, um, you have a 2 to a 3 for this path loss constant. So, we have a certain loss of the signal just because of distance and due to the environment. So, what kind of powers do we talk about here? If you have ever heard of DBM, DBM is actually what your wireless radio puts out, always with reference to a 1 milliwatt. So, the DBM ratio is basically the transmit power becomes 10 log 10 the transmit power divided by one milliwatt. So what does that mean? Well, if you hear somebody talking about an 8 dB, 80 dBm transmitter, well, that's a 100 kilowatt tower. That's a huge FM broadcasting station. What's the typical rate that your cell phones are using? 27 dBm, so about 500 milliwatts. What does yours say? <laughs> Minus? That's the reception. This is about transmitting. So your cell phone is probably transmitting at around half a watt, 500 milliwatts. The towers transmit at about 100 watts. Don't have it on here. Right? So and what you receive, as I just read, is about minus 37 dBm. So that's somewhere down here in the nanowatts, probably. So you have a cell phone tower that transmits at 100 watt. All you receive is a couple of microwatts to nanowatts. But it's enough because we can decode these signals. We can actually decode what's actually happening on the wireless channel, so it's enough power. But you can see the, it's a huge range of different powers that we are using. Another problem is the transmission itself. If I'm transmitting out of an antenna, unfortunately we don't have a circular model that happens. So what does that mean? Well, if we have a transmitter that's sitting here in the middle and it's transmitting its radio broadcasting, the reception is not exactly the same around it. These problems can happen then that you have two receivers, one of them at 16 meters, the other one at 30 meters. But the problem is that the one at 30 meters has actually a worse signal than the one at 60 meters. Just because of how the echoes happen and how the propagation path is established. So sometimes just because you can hear somebody else doesn't mean that you're further or closer to the transmitter than somebody who cannot hear that particular person. So you have a non-disc model in connectivity of over the wireless channel. There's another problem that's called the hidden terminal problem. Think about it exactly in this scenario, right? Where this guy here in the middle transmits a message out, both of these receive it and transmit back. But assume that these two guys can't hear each other. What would happen? 
Yeah, you, I think you're getting to the right conclusion. Yeah. Exactly. I think this one transmits, receives, receives, and they then start transmitting. Right? They will transmit and the guy in the middle will hear it because he receives both signals at the same time. Off we go, collision. So that's where MAC protocols become very important. And there's a lot of research going on in medium access control protocols. These are protocols that try to avoid exactly these kind of situations, making sure that only one person talks on a channel at the same time. And there's a lot of different taxonomies around it. So there is, for example, random access versus scheduled. So random access is where everybody can just freely go and try to use the channel, where in scheduled protocols, you have a very specific schedule that people have to, oops, that people have to adhere to. You can have time slotted versus non-slotted ones. You can have peer-to-peer -peer versus master-slave systems, or you can have Mac level retransmission kind of things where this happens. So in peer-to-peer -peer versus master-slave, peer-to-peer is when everybody has the same level and everybody can just try and talk and you organize yourself. While in a master-slave, that's for example when you're, you're connecting to an access point where the access point is the master on the channel and will actually tell you when you can use the channel. And you can see how a lot of different protocols start to appear if you have these kind of different possibilities. Just to get, get you some names that you might have heard before, Alua was one of the first protocols out there, MAC protocols out there. Um, anybody I guess why it's called Alua? Sorry? It was made actually in Hawaii, yes. Um, it was one of the wireless systems that they had for boats, and so it was developed out in the Pacific, and they called it Aloha. Um, IEEE 802.11 um, is a good example of a carrier sends sends multiple access with collision avoidance. So if you have here CSMACA, that's what 802.15.4 uses, then you have 802.11 in, uh, 802.11, I'm sorry, um, you get a lot of different kind of protocols. There is an 802.11 in infrastructure PCF mode where you have a scheduled polling slotless master. So the master is basically polling the channel, asking every now and then, um, does somebody have something to transmit? Bluetooth Pico nets um, are yet another type of um, MAC protocols. And then you can get many protocols that are time division, multiple access, or TDMA. Or you can have a CDMA, which is a code division, multiple access. So in TDMA protocols, you use time for different slots, while in CDMA, everybody can actually use the same channel at the same time, but you use certain codes to identify the different users um, and figuring out who is actually talking when. There is a lot of wireless MAC protocols out there. So there's wireless hard that you might hear at some point, ISA 10, uh, 100.11, or IDA 254E. There's, I think, now an 802.54F, and a lot of different standards are coming out all the time. All of these different MAC protocols have a certain specific use and oftentimes are extremely good in one particular area, but not in another. So oftentimes you can use them for very low, good low power applications, but they're not very good for high data rates. So there are a lot of different MAC protocols out there that got developed. All right, one more thing, multi-hop routing, right? Now assume you have, you're not in a nice, infrastructure environment like here where you have an access point and then many computers connecting to this particular access point. Imagine you want to talk to somebody else that's further away from the access point or if that person also wants to get access to the internet but it can actually use somebody else as an access to the internet. That's what's called multi-hop routing. Many ad hoc networks actually can establish multi-hop systems where you go across multiple nodes before you reach, for example, a certain gateway. Yet again, it's a lot of research out there for different kind of multi-hop protocols. There is um, any to any routing so that if you have a big swarm of nodes, you can establish routes that anybody can route to anybody else inside this network. Um, some algorithms in there are called DSTV, DSR, AODB, um, and many others. Yes? So, not necessarily. If you just take a transceiver chip, you can implement these protocols yourself, if you want to. If you don't want to implement one of these, then you have to go and find a chip that has them implemented. 
or find a software package that can use a certain radio chip that implemented some of these protocols. Geographic routing is another kind of thing where you use geography and location information to route data packets around. And um, there's algorithms for directed diffusions, flooding, gossiping, trickle, lots of different things out there that exist for multi-hop routing. Okay, just a few more words um, before we conclude this, um, this lecture. Power becomes a huge problem in radio chips. Here are a couple of power numbers. A radio chip, the CC2520, which is actually a radio chip you will be using in lab 6, it draws 18.5 milliamps while receiving and can draw up to 33.6 milliamps while transmitting. Okay, compare this to one of the biggest MSP430s. If it's running at full power, it draws 5.7 milliamps. Right? Compare these numbers. Your radio consumes six times more, five to six times more power than your microcontroller if it's running at full time, at 100% duty cycle. But in standby, the radio draws only one micron. So if you can shut it off, you're good to go, right? It's basically sitting there but not doing much at all, or it doesn't do anything, it doesn't draw any power. Now compared to the actual smart fuse, you so your big board microcontroller you have on there, if it runs at full blast, it draws 400 milliamps. So even your smart fusion draws only just a little 40 milliamps. Thank you. And your, even your smart fusion draws only a little bit more than the radio chip that's transmitting or even receiving. So you have to make sure that there's some protocol in there that turns your radio off if you don't need it. And that's where low power wireless protocol wireless MAC protocols come into place. These wireless MAC protocols are designed to turn off the radio as often as you can. And what does the problem become in these cases? Well, if you have two nodes, A and B, one of them is transmitting, it has to somehow make sure that the other guy is actually receiving it at the same time, right? You somehow have to have a schedule of nodes or some mechanism to deal with this asynchronous behavior of when do you wake up? When are you asleep? And there are two different scenarios that you can very easily imagine. One of them is, well, if node A wants to talk to somebody, it just sends out a certain carrier telling that, hey, I want to talk to you somebody. I want to talk to somebody. If the other node wakes up, it starts receiving this carrier. It hears, oh, okay, somebody wants to talk to me. And then at the end, they can start talking to each other. Right? The key here is that node A has to transmit this carrier for at least as long as the node B sleeps. Make sense? So this is kind of an asynchronous approach. There's no synchronization in here. Everybody can sleep and wake up whenever you want. You just make sure that everybody has the same period, which is fairly easy to do. And then if you want to talk to somebody, you just talk for at least one period of time you make sure that the other guy actually really woke up at least once inside this period. The other way of dealing with this could be a synchronous approach where you synchronize once, so you just wait and talk and on the channel, keep your radio on all the time until you hear somebody else and then you decide on, okay, next time you wake up five milliseconds from now and we go now to sleep. And when five milliseconds happen or 50 milliseconds, they wake both up again, they can talk to each other, they go back to sleep. So a very synchronized approach of dealing with the channel. There are advantages and disadvantages in both of them. For example, disadvantage on this side here is that the radio has to stay on longer for every time you want to talk to somebody, while on this side over here, if your two clocks are getting out of sync, you can, might have to spend another resynchronization period to find each other again. Are we going to stop here for today? I hope this was useful. Uh, when you see any kind of Wireless protocol, maybe you can get to these slides, find some something, and if you want, there is a couple of um, references on here on um, research articles on wireless protocols. Okay, that will be it. Thank you.